Good afternoon and welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. Founded in 1976 by 13 visionary women leaders, CMC's mission is to connect people and ideas through community conversation. From its beginnings, CMC has welcomed everyone. I'm Eddie Pauline, President and CEO of BioOhio and a member of the CMC Board of Trustees. I also serve as the chairperson of Worthington's Community Relations Commission, which is involved in this effort uh, today. And thank you to today's forum sponsors, AARP Ohio, Central Ohio Community Improvement Corporation, the Columbus Foundation, the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission, Move to Prosper, Nationwide Children's Hospital, The Ohio State University, United Way of Central Ohio, Thank you all. We are also grateful to today's forum partners. A full listing of today's partners and today's forum attendees can be found in your forum flyer on your table. Today's CMC live streaming is presented by the Emergency Response Fund of the Columbus Foundation in partnership with the Columbus Dispatch and PNC. Thank you all. At today's forum, Building Inclusive Communities, we'll hear about the myriad ways housing affects a community. From quality of life, ease of transportation, employment, healthcare, and access to good schools. But before we hear from our distinguished panel, it's CMC's honor to invite Michael Wilkos, Senior Vice President of Community Impact, from our sponsor, United Way of Central Ohio, to the podium to introduce our speakers. Michael, the podium is yours. Here you are. Thank you, Eddie. The census recently released 2020 data. Almost half of Ohio's growth occurred within the city of Columbus almost the other half occurred in Columbus's suburbs. And there was a tiny little bit in the other 78 counties in the state. The city of Columbus just experienced its largest numeric increase in population in our history, adding 119,000 people in 10 years. It was our fastest growth rate in 70 years. And we grew faster than Dallas, Houston, Phoenix, or Nashville. I'm reminded about what makes a city work by author Anna Quinlan, who said, the experiment of cities is how close can rich and poor live before the fabric completely falls apart? How close can you put ethnic groups that don't really like each other much? How much can you promise about a rich and privileged future and then not really be able to deliver before they rise up and say enough? And the answer here is over and over again is that the fabric becomes tattered, it even becomes torn, but the fabric survives. As a city, we have never been more diverse, more influential, and more complex than right now. In the past year and a half, Columbus's fabric has become tattered. It even became torn. But there are more construction cranes in the sky than ever before, and we will continue to grow. Will we welcome new arrivals? Will we build socially, economically, and environmentally stable communities? And every day at United Way of Central Ohio, we and more of our 90 funded partners, we think about the 400,000 Franklin County residents whose promise of a better future is still without reach. Please welcome today's speakers. Richard Kathlenberg, Senior Fellow, the Century Foundation. Lorianne Feibel, Council President, City of Bexley. Calvin Cooper, CEO and co-founder of Rove. And our host, Dr. Kim Campbell, Director of Enrollment Management at Mount Carmel College of Nursing. As always, you can learn more about today's speakers in your forum flyer. Before we begin the conversation, I would like to invite Richard Rathenberg to the podium. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Michael. And it's, it's wonderful to be with you all. I have, uh, over the years, I've spent many 
uh, wonderful times with people in different communities talking about uh, various public policy issues. And, uh, but for the last, I don't know, 20 months or so, I've, I've been in hibernation, uh, like a lot of you have been. And so this is the, the first time in a long time that I have been able to, to be in person with a group like this. And, and I'm just, I'm so excited. Uh, the, I'm not gonna have to worry about forgetting to unmute. Uh, and, and the other wonderful thing is, I guess as a, as a speaker, is that uh, none of you can turn off your videos, go do laundry. You're kind of you're stuck uh, listening. So, um, so this is a great, great opportunity. It's, it's also wonderful to be here in, in Ohio, uh, which is a state that contains you know, the, the multitude of, of uh, political diversity uh, within one state. Uh, and, and what I want to start with is, I think, an area of common ground uh, for, for all of us, uh, which is that no matter your political ideology, you probably want better opportunities for, for low-income students. Uh, we will have arguments back and forth about whether adult poverty is the cause of society or the cause of the individual. Uh, but no one would argue that low-income students, low-income children, uh, who are in no way responsible for their economic condition, uh, uh, everyone will agree that they, they deserve better. Uh, now, the research is clear that one of the very, very best things we can do for low-income students is to give them a chance to live in middle-class or mixed-income communities and attend middle-class or uh, mixed-income schools rather than high-poverty schools. Uh, Raj Chetty of Harvard University, for example, found that when low-income uh, children move before the age of 13 to a higher-opportunity neighborhood, uh, their chances of graduating from college increase by 16%, uh, and their lifetime earnings increase uh, by 31%, uh, which is the equivalent of $302,000 uh, over, over uh, one's lifetime. Uh, so the question then becomes, what is blocking the opportunity of uh, children to have access to uh, safe neighborhoods with, uh, with strong public schools. And many of us, uh, I think, assume that uh, it's, it's simply the workings of the free market and housing, that some people earn more money, can afford to live in uh, more privileged neighborhoods where the schools are often, often stronger. Uh, but I think what that misses is that, uh, in fact, where people live has been socially engineered uh, by government uh, for, for decades now. Uh, and the, uh, the primary issue that I want to talk about today and that I hope we'll get into in the, in the panel discussion is the way in which zoning laws uh, inhibit uh, opportunity. Zoning laws that prohibit the building of anything but a single family home. So you cannot build in a, a duplex or a triplex or a modest size apartment building uh, throughout uh, many uh, metropolitan uh, or, or neighborhoods within metropolitan areas in the country. And that's true uh, in Columbus as well. And I call these policies uh, the walls we don't see because uh, most of us don't spend a lot of time thinking about, about zoning. Uh, everyone can understand that when, in the 1960s, black children were prohibited from attending uh, racially integrated schools in the South, uh, that that was, was wrong. Uh, many of us recall Norman Rockwell's famous painting with uh, six-year-old Ruby Bridges a young black girl trying to attend uh, an integrated school surrounded by these enormous FBI agents because there were, were screaming mobs, that uh, white mobs, that were uh, uh, 
trying to uh, seek her, um, seek to block her from attending the school. Uh, but I would argue that you know today, in 2021, local government policies have erected a series of walls around uh, the various communities that keep low-income children and their parents uh, from having the opportunity to enjoy uh, these safe neighborhoods and, and good schools. And, and we just, we, do, we don't think much about it. We don't think there's any, any comparison to what Ruby Bridges was going through. Uh, now, researching this issue, I was particularly interested in what's going on in Columbus uh, for, for a couple of reasons. Um, in part, the issues of exclusion are um, particularly acute here. So some of you may know that uh, of the major uh, 50 metropolitan areas in the country, Columbus ranks second in economic segregation, the division uh, in where uh, low-income people live and where wealthier people live, according to a study by Richard Florida. Uh, very relatedly, uh, Raj Chetty at Harvard found that Columbus ranks very, very low in terms of social mobility. Uh, so of the 50 uh, biggest metropolitan areas, uh, Columbus ranks 45th out of 50th in the likelihood that low-income children will have the opportunity to grow up to do better economically. Uh, and Chetty tied those two issues together, uh, the, the economic segregation and racial segregation he finds uh, has a direct link to declines in, in so decreases in social mobility. So how did Columbus get into this predicament? Uh, well, I think we decided not to do PowerPoint, but I'm sneaking around that. We've got a couple of um, maps at your, at your table that kind of explain, explain the issue. And um, if you can start with the map, uh, the map that looks, that looks like this. Uh, so this is, uh, the, on the left-hand side is a, what's known as the red lining map from, from the 1930s. Um, so in the green areas, the federal government agreed to insure mortgages and invest in those communities. And in the red areas, it refused to. Uh, and many of you are probably familiar with this term of redlining, uh, that uh, those are the communities that were predominantly black uh, that the federal government refused to um, insure mortgages in. Now the map on the right uh, shows uh, in dark blue areas those regions of Columbus uh, and Franklin County today that are uh, zoned for single family homes only. No duplexes, no triplexes, no apartment buildings. It's illegal to put those types of units there. And these are uh, in large measure areas where working class people have less access uh, and um, and, uh, and less opportunity. So uh, if you can flip to the second set of maps uh, now, um, you'll see uh, a similar uh, depiction of what are the high opportunity areas in uh, Franklin County and surrounding, uh, the surrounding area. So uh, the Kirwan Institute at Ohio State University has done really pioneering work they try to identify communities that have strong schools, uh, access to jobs, uh, and other amenities, and found that in the dark red, you see the higher opportunity areas, uh, which uh, are often off limits to working class families um, uh, because there are fewer uh, multifamily housing opportunities there. And then the final map uh, shows where uh, African American people live in Franklin County. And you can see in comparing that to the Kerwin Institute uh, map that uh, black people in, in uh, this area tend to be concentrated in the areas that have the least opportunity. Uh, now all of this is very discouraging, um, but the other big reason that I was attracted to Columbus was that you have here a really innovative program uh, that is trying to do something about these problems. 
Uh, it's called Move to Prosper, um, and it gives a uh, small number of single mothers the chance to uh, live in higher opportunity communities like, uh, like Dublin and Gahana. Uh, and, and one mother I interviewed um, for a report I wrote about, about Columbus and, and Move to Prosper, uh, Chiara Cornelius, told me that before Move to Prosper, she was living in South Columbus in a dangerous neighborhood. Uh, her mother lived a few blocks away and yet when her, when uh, Chiara Cornelius' children wanted to go visit their grandmother, she would have to drive them because she felt like it was too dangerous uh, to let her kids, her, or, or to, to walk with her kids to the grandmother's house. Um, so she wanted better for herself and her family, uh, like all of us, and uh, was through Move to Prosper able to, to move to Dublin, uh, where she feels safe and where her kids are, are thriving in the schools. Now, Move to Prosper is a small program. It has uh, 10 families, uh, and it serves in some ways as, as a catapult of sorts over the walls that have been built by government uh, through zoning policies. So the question becomes, what additional things uh, should, be, should be done? And I want to, um, there are a million things that should be done, and I'm sure we'll get into it in the discussion, but just let me list four steps forward uh, to, to kind of set the stage for some more discussion. Uh, first of all, I think it would be great if Move to Prosper were expanded uh, so that there were more families who had the opportunity, like, like Chiara Cornelius. Uh, second, uh, there are a number of communities throughout the country that have begin to, begun to tear down those exclusionary walls. So Charlotte, uh, Minneapolis, uh, the state of Oregon, the state of California have all said we're going to legalize uh, duplexes, triplexes, and um, at, at, at the beginning stage uh, in order to uh, allow for more people with uh, a more modest means to live in higher opportunity areas. Now, liberals tend to like this as a form of social justice and racial justice, uh, but many conservatives have applauded these efforts too because they see zoning laws as in essence a form of government regulation that is stopping property owners from doing what they want on their own land uh, and that this uh, change is, is in essence a form of, of deregulation. Uh, third, uh, Ohio could outlaw what's known as source of income discrimination. And, and I know Bexley's been a leader on this, so we're going to talk more about that, that issue uh, in a moment. Um, but, uh, you know, if, if someone like Chiara Cornelius, who is African American, uh, went to a landlord and was said, uh, was told, uh, you know, I'm not going to rent to you because you're black. Thankfully, that is now, you know, since 1968, that has been illegal. It is perfectly legal in uh, most of Ohio to say, if you have a housing voucher, uh, I, I don't want you in, in this, uh, this community. I'm not going to rent to you. Um, and so that's another thing that, that could be done here for reform. There are 19 states that have adopted uh, protections for source of income, or outlawed source of income discrimination, and that's, uh, that's something that Ohio could consider. Final thing is uh, uh, inclusionary zoning. And I have been driving uh, with Kathy Fox around uh, various parts of Columbus the last couple of days, and um, I've seen all, the, all these uh, you know, amazing new apartment buildings that look beautiful, uh, that have sprung up in recent years. Um, but in many communities, there are efforts to make sure that at least some portion of uh, the low income and working class community can, can participate in those types of um, uh, housing complexes by setting aside a percentage of those units for lo low income and working class people. So uh, final thing I'll say is that the current system of government sponsored exclusion um, is, is bad for everyone. You know it's bad for for everyone in this room when we're not tapping into the the talents of uh, 
families who, whose kids have so much to offer uh, but are now constrained to, to uh, high poverty schools that, that lots of research suggests are, are on average going to be less effective. Uh, but these state-sponsored rules also deprive more affluent kids in suburban areas from uh, the benefits of the educational benefits of diversity. Uh, we all know that we learn from one another all the time. And when affluent students are, uh, are segregated in their own enclaves, they miss out on the opportunity to, to learn from, from diversity. Uh, we're, we're just beginning to come out of a pandemic where the really many of the heroes uh, have been working class people, uh, grocery clerks, um, paramedics, and others who've, who've seen the rest of us through, through this terrible time. And, and I'm hoping that this discussion today will be uh, part of an effort to, to open up the doors to those individuals and their children to, uh, to enjoy the opportunities that so, much, so many of us have, have taken for granted. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kim Campbell, as you heard, and I'm honored to be with you for this important and timely discussion. So my first question is really gonna be directed at Lorianne. Lucky you, right? So Lorianne, if you could share with us as president of uh, the city council in Bexley, why do you, as a local elected official, support inclusive communities? Just curious, and a little bit of background about um, this work. Um, thanks, Kim. Um, it's so good to see you. <laughs> We've missed each other a lot. Um, you know, I get to talk about two things that I am so, so passionate about today. And one is Bexley, Ohio, and the other one is Move to Prosper. Um, Bragging about Bexley is something that uh, most Bexleyites love to do. And our um, Bexley Community Foundation really does a good job. They love to say that it's the best place to live, work, learn, and play. And recently, they added the word care. And it's so um, appropriate. We live in a city that's very small, 2.5 square miles full of volunteers who love to care. Our children who are on federal assistance for food, um, lunches, um, they have to eat in the summertime too. So Bexley takes care of them. So as not to embarrass the kids who get federal funding, we had parents who got together and found a grant so that all of our kids can eat for free. Our sweet, caring residents insist that we put uh, policy behind what they know is right. And in um, 2016, we put together an anti-discrimination um, ordinance. In um, 2019, we wrote a resolution and um, passed it to welcome, to welcome refugees. And I'm most proud, most proud, of our source of income legislation that I was able to write and advocate for and get passed. We are super proud of the fact that we did it and that the other municipalities around us, four of them, have adopted that as well. I like to say that uh, people like to be like the cool kids. You know, they, they, they follow us. Um, I've heard that diversity um, is asking people to the party. 
and inclusion is asking them to dance. And uh, Bexley loves a good party. The more the merrier. We also know that when we learn, when we ask people to dance, we all learn a new step. So. Thank you very much. Calvin, next question is for you. Having heard all of this very compelling information that Rick gave and Lorianne's background, you also have a very interesting background yourself that we would love to hear about, and especially how your life experiences influenced your interest in real estate. Absolutely, and, and thank you so much, um, and thank thank the audience for being with us today. And I appreciate that that saying. I love that inclusion is asking people to dance. I hadn't heard the next part, so <laughs> we all learn a new step. But I grew up here in Columbus. I went to Columbus Public Schools, so I love this city, and and we live in a wonderful time. Um, it's a wonderful time to be a human, in spite of what you see on TV. I mean, we have access to so much knowledge. And in spite of what you hear about Columbus Public Schools, um, I had access to tons of resources, tutors after school to teach me math. Um, got to play the trumpet, the violin, the piano. Um, had access to AP coursework, and then went on to Capital University in Bexley, and had wonderful <laughs> professors who taught me um, research and took me under their wing. Tons of mentors here, um, business leaders, politicians, and so, so much of, of my life um, not growing up uh, well off, but then um, finding uh, a way to build a career for myself has been um, people reaching out and opening a door for me, and and it's all about access and opportunity. So that's, that's my core passion. That's why at Rove, our mission is to expand access and opportunity for everyone to own in our communities because ownership is so important. We want every renter to be an owner. We want everyone in the community to be an owner. And we know that when you have ownership, you care more, you invest more, you volunteer more, and, and you show up. And, and invest in the community. And so what, what is more important than housing? It's a basic need. And if we look at um, our country and the problems that we face, um, we're, we're facing an ownership crisis, particularly in housing. Um, millennials have zero dollars in net real estate wealth, zero. Uh, much less than uh, previous generations. And this is a driver of um, wealth inequality. And we know that. Um, if we don't solve this problem, we will have ci a civic unrest. We will have it. Um, and that's something that uh, even our founding fathers knew. Um, John Adams wrote about this, our second president um, and, and constitutional framer wrote that the balance of power, in order to maintain the balance of power on the side of equal liberty and public virtue, we must make land ownership available to everybody. And so it is of critical importance to our democracy that we solve this problem. That's great. So I'm going to ask you a follow-up question then. So in your opinion, what is the role of property ownership in inclusive communities? Uh, it's, it's, so it's multifold. So for one, what stands in the way of um, solving this housing crisis? It's self-inflicted. We have more than enough resources and capital and ingenuity um, to, to provide food and shelter to every human being on Earth. And so um, what stands in the way? And if you think about um, housing in America in our major cities, cities that are growing like Columbus, it's often um, you've got this not in my backyard mindset that stands in the way of new development. Some of the policies that were mentioned that can um, uh, help us uh, expand the housing supply. And the people who show up, we, we have a democracy, which is awesome, so everybody can contribute. And the people who show up often are the loudest voices in the room, but they don't necessarily represent all of the people in the room, right? Um, and so who's missing? Oftentimes, it are the, it's the people who are renters. Um, it's the people who are um, renting now in a neighborhood, but um, it's also the people who are missing who will live in the neighborhood in the future. So I believe if we open up ownership and we make investing and in owning real estate available to everybody, uh, more people will participate. You will have more Yimbies, yes in my backyard, crowd in the room 
that's missing. Ownership is missing from the Yimby movement. And so we're seeing more people come together in every city, um, more for altruistic reasons, saying we need more housing for more people at every price point. Now imagine how powerful that movement's gonna be when they can say, and I'll invest in that project. Very good. So having heard some of the information that Rick shared with us, and this is for any of the panelists that would like to answer this, we understand that not all suburbs want to see economic inclusion. What is the best response to those individuals? out they're missing out on so so much it's 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 the creativity that they're missing out on it's um, the ability to problem solve from different angles uh, I, there's just so much that we miss out on we when we don't include people if I, if I can just piggyback on that I, I mean I think what you're saying is backed up by, you know, mounds of research in addition to, you know, y y y your experience. It's, uh, th this is something that, that uh, colleges figured out a long time ago. If you want to have an interesting discussion, you need people from different walks of life who come together to have that discussion. If everyone has a very similar background, uh, the learning is not going to be as deep. Uh, the the um, the dialogue will not be nearly as interesting, and so um, opening up communities to uh, racial, economic diversity, people who um, have have had different life experiences will uh, will deepen the, um, the the learning that goes on in schools uh, and the learning that goes on among adults. We don't stop learning uh, just because we're you know we reach a certain age, and so. Um, Business has learned this a long time ago as well, that when you are trying to solve a problem, you bring people who have different po points of view, different uh, experiences, and kind of, so education has, has seen this, business has seen this, but we haven't taken the additional step to make sure that communities can benefit from uh, all that the diversity brings. Our children really, really need this. They, to be able to, make it in the world that they are being asked to be successful in, they need to have that diversity. And it makes them stronger people and it opens their minds to new ideas and new cultures and, and new friends. And it's, real, it's really, it, it makes, I know our children, my three children have such a diverse group of friends and I know my husband and I learned so much from what they have taught us because that is the world that they're living in. I think one other response would just be why? That's a question. Uh, we need to hear each other more. If you, you go to some of these neighborhood meetings, it's just yelling at each other like this is what I think, this is what I think. Sometimes we just gotta ask why and then unpack that five whys deep and hear people and sometimes so on a macro level, it's not zero sum, but sometimes on the micro level, there are trade-offs and we need to hear people out um, and then work together to address those concerns so that they can hear the stories about, you know, once, once somebody feels heard, they're more receptive to hearing about the value in diversity or, or what, what we're proposing. Thank you. So for those business leaders in the community, what is your response when the question is asked, why should businesses support the building of inclusive communities? Oh, oh, go ahead. Oh, yes. Yeah, it's, it's you all want to jump into this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, we, we live in a, a dynamic ecosystem. One, one of the, the lifebloods of business is talent, and we need diverse talent. Um, and, and we all know that businesses are stronger when there's diversity at every level. Um, and so that's, that's one reason. The other reason is um, people choose to work with a company, but they also choose to move into a community and people are whole people. And so one of the greatest amenities we can give to our workforce is a wonderful place to live. And I'll just add that, um, the uh, 
you know, when employers are looking at trying to, to get the benefits of diversity and um, make sure they capitalize on that, one of the issues they run into is that people, uh, employees haven't experienced diversity before the workplace. And they haven't experienced it in their schools and in their neighborhoods. And so there are a lot of tensions. And actually the, the number one reason that people are fired on the job is, is not because they're incompetent. It's because they can't get along with other people, oftentimes people of other, you know, different backgrounds. And so uh, many businesses have um, uh, embraced diversity, equity, inclusion in the workplace. Uh, but uh, if, if we get at these issues earlier, when children are young, uh, and if businesses can support that, then, uh, then the, the work that they're doing to support diversity, equity, and inclusion at the, in the workplace will be all, all that much easier. Um, the other thing I want to mention quickly is, um, as relates to exclusionary zoning in particular, is that a lot of businesses throughout the country have begun to uh, want to open up communities to more forms of housing because uh, they're having trouble attracting employees given the cost of, of living. Uh, and this is particularly acute in places like Cal California in the Bay Area where s all the Silicon Valley employers have, have banded together to support the YIMBY effort that Calvin mentioned, um, you know, yes in my backyard, because they can't attract employees when housing's so expensive. And I know Columbus is not exactly where California is in terms of housing prices. But from what I'm reading, you're, you're moving in that direction. Uh, things are becoming much less affordable. And that's a direct, that's directly correlated to exclusionary zoning. Because when you have a certain amount of land and you say, well, you know, we're only gonna allow a single family home, maybe on a quarter acre, you can't build anything more. That artificially decreases the supply of housing. So just like OPEC tries to drive up oil prices by decreasing the supply of oil, uh, single family uh, exclusionary zoning um, drives up housing prices and makes, you know, makes, makes housing less affordable and that's, that's bad, for, it's bad for everyone, but it, it's also bad for employers who are trying to attract, uh, attract talent. Thank you. Uh, Calvin, to piggyback on what um, Rick just shared with us, can you tell us about the differences between typical real estate investors and the MBs that he talked about, the yes in my backyard you were attracting to your real estate investment platform? Yeah, um, so one note, I know it doesn't seem like we're as bad as San Francisco, but I published an article about this in Forbes. Um, if you look at uh, the knowledge worker base and the middle class, um, the percentage of Rent Burton households in Columbus, Ohio, is about the same as it is in San Francisco, right? When you take income to the price of rent, um, and, and if you're spending over a quarter of your income on rent, then you're in rent burn. And so that's, that's an interesting note. Um, but if you think about um, real estate finance, we're in the MySpace um, uh, E-Trade days of investing in real estate online, and we're about to move into the Coinbase, Robinhood, Reddit days. Um, and what's fascinating is people are coming together on the internet um, and they're having conversations and investing in public companies. And what that does to public companies is more and more people are thinking about ESG because of um, employee advocacy, customer advocacy, but now because of investors. And when we open the market up for the average person to invest as little as a dollar in real estate, they're investing for return on investment reasons. Yes, that's table stakes, but so often we're, we're investing for a return on community because we value things. Um, in addition to things that fit nicely in a spreadsheet, we have additional values. And so that's gonna unlock a lot of creativity and ingenuity in real estate finance. Thank you very much, Calvin. We're going to move two questions from our in-person and live stream audiences in just a moment, but I have one final question, and that's gonna be for Lori Ann. We heard Rick talk about Move to Prosper, and our theme today is the need for innovation in housing. 
So if you could share as a supporter of the housing, hospital, or mobility program, Move to Prosper, what about the program is innovative and what convinces you it can make a difference? Well, it can make a difference. Um, the data suggests that that's so true, that children who, and I think Rick spoke about this, children who at the age of 13 move from a community that is not thriving into a community that is thriving, they have so many more possibilities. I like to say they get the opportunity to become the best them they can be. Um, from teenage pregnancy to their, their salaries as adults, um, all of those things um, add up to be something super positive. And Move to Prosper has proven already and gives an amazingly compelling argument for teaching women how to fish, not giving them fish, but teaching them how. And it's innovative because it embraces the mom. And we all know if the mom's not happy, if the mom's not thriving, the kids aren't either. And so, you know, helping with coaching. And, you know, some of the things that we, some people learn early on on how to budget your money, how to get a job, how to keep a job, how to write a resume, how to get your kids into a, into a, a new environment, a new school environment, helping, helping parents with IEPs and getting the children settled. It's not easy to supplement, to finance, to help finance a move, but that is what Move to Prosper is dedicated to doing. Supplementing someone's uh, housing such that they are able to not only move into a thriving community, but they can succeed in a thriving community. And it sounds so innovating and exciting to me as a member of a city that's landlocked, that's very hard to be able to figure out where and how we can accommodate, we're gonna have to continue to think of um, exciting, innovative ways in Bexley, but my being able to support an organization like Move to Prosper makes me feel like I am making a difference in our region. Thank you, Lorianne. It is CMC's tr long-standing tradition to take audience questions. Jane Scott of CMC is curating questions from the live stream audience. For our in-house audience, please join Jane at the microphone. We do ask that you keep your questions brief and to the point. Jane, what is our first question? Well, we have, we have quite a few questions, so please, anyone who does have a question, just get up behind me and we'll do every other one. Um, Move to Prosper has been discussed a great deal. It's doing wonderful work. And the woman who, just for instance, the woman who moved from that neighborhood to a better neighborhood, what happens to the neighborhood? Do we, for, do we give up on that neighborhood? And is, does the community still have a responsibility to improve that neighborhood so people don't have to move to a different neighborhood? That's a hard question, and I'm sure uh, both of you would agree with that. Um, uh, you know, as I legislate, I, I always say that I never take my mom hat off. And I always want the best for my children. And um, by my children, I don't mean my own, but the children I'll never meet. And I believe in giving women a choice as to where they think their children will thrive. And, as, and, and it's a very philosophical question about the, the, the neighborhood that they're leaving behind, but as far as I'm concerned, when, when you become a mom, that's your number one. And it takes, and it's a yes and. It's a yes, we need to make sure that women have their choice. No, we should not uh, leave the neighborhood behind, but we need to give these women choices as to where they think that their children would survive. 
And that choice is so important. I'd say um, my mom, uh, she went through a few divorces, so she's college educated. But when we were on public assistance, it was because of that transition period. And she worked really hard to ensure that we weren't in a bad neighborhood for more than a year um, and wanted to make to get us uh, to a place where we cannot be as distracted by violence and other things. And so it's important to give people a choice. Uh, the solution isn't to limit the choice for people who can't afford it. Why should people who are wealthy and middle class have more freedom to move than people who are poor? They shouldn't. We should have the choice. It's a yes and thing. And we need to come together to, to improve that neighborhood that's being left behind so that people choose to move there. Hello, uh, my name is quickly, just really quickly. The, the, um, th this has been the classic debate, uh, you know, in housing policy circles for, for decades. Do you invest in uh, high poverty communities or do you allow choice? And I agree with both of you. That, that, that you have to do both, uh, but, but the, I don't think anyone was suggesting move to prosper is the only answer to this set of problems, but it's got to be part of the solution to allow for choice for families. I mean, I was, when I was studying the program, I found that, uh, you know, w was astonished that there were, there were 10 spots open and uh, there was a question you know, would people want to potentially subject their kids to discrimination in the, in the more affluent areas? Would, would people want this? 300 people applied. So there's demand for this, and we have to honor that, uh, and at the same time, make sure we invest in, um, in communities that are, are struggling now and, and attract uh, economic and racial cross-section throughout the metropolitan area. So, sorry. Thank you. Um, name is Valerie Gilbert. I moved to the South Side a couple of years ago, and if I'm to believe the uh, real estate online sites, my properties doubled in value. And my question is, how do we stem the tide of gentrification that, in my opinion, inhibits the real the home ownership opportunities, particularly in the poorer neighborhoods? So the word STEM progress, right? Uh, stasis isn't an option. Um, if we think about it, Ryan Holiday is one of my favorite authors, and he, he writes about stoicism, and he distills it down into everyday language, because Marcus really is hard to read. Um, but my favorite book of his is The Obstacle is the Way. The Obstacle is the Way. And um, when you think about that, um, almost every problem is the result of solving a previous problem. So it comes out of a solution, right? So we're like, man, what about divestment in our community? Why won't people build here? Where are the jobs? Where are we gonna work? Why can't my kids go here? There's a food desert, right? Solve that problem. Boom, now you have development, right? So the, the problem of gentrification is the solution to the last problem. And so the, the solution isn't to go backwards, it's to go forwards and figure out how do we reimagine housing finance? Why can't everybody own a piece of real estate with a dollar? They can now. Download the Rove app. <laughs> so Alicia Gregory asks, what are some actionable items we can do as individuals? What are actionable items we can encourage our cities to do if they are not involved in this conversation already? Well, uh, individuals could volunteer for Move to Prosper. We would love that, especially if you've got some special talents that we could use. Um, and I also think that individuals can, can write their local representatives, ask them, stay on them, bring them information. That's what Amy Claven did to me. She, she brought information to me, she, um, she stayed with me, she educated me, she made sure that I was passionate about it. Um, I was telling Rick that I, I, I had heard that there are, there are um, two days in your life that should be your favorite days. Um, the day we're born 
and the day that you learned why you were born. I feel like housing and, and helping other moms you know, make a better life for their babies is, is what I potentially have been called to do. And I've always, always been serving children. And people that know me know my dear love for these little people and their little minds and the possibilities th that they have. So I would, I would urge individuals to volunteer in situations and advocacy situations like Move to Prosper and to make sure that you have the ear of your local, of your local government officials. Next question. Good, af <clears throat> Good afternoon, I'm Bill Wayhoff of Steptoe and Johnson PLC and uh, the opportunity zone legislation that occurred and has been utilized uh, in various areas is now a number of years old. And I was just wondering if any of the panelists had a good handle on whether or not that's had a positive effect in the areas on, that, on the map uh, that was shown earlier today as far as, you know, more prosperity in those areas, more good redevelopment where the folks that live there now can continue to work, live and work there. Uh, I know our Rotary Club is doing a lot of things in the Linden area, for example, and, you know, but this government program, the Opportunity Zones, what effect has that had uh, on, if any, on those areas? Thank you. Our legislation is, is brand new as of October. And I know that the six other cities in, um, in Ohio, it's fairly new for them too. So I think that's something that we're going to have to watch. And as a fellow Rotarian, I, uh, I, I know that we all try very much um, to help in, in lots of ways when when we do service of the self, <laughs> I'm looking at yet another Rotarian <laughs> in the crowd. Um, but I don't know, Rick, can you speak to some older legislation that's, that's been on the... Yeah. Well, well, so there's, there's federal legislation to provide tax breaks to uh, uh, individuals and companies that are going to invest in high poverty communities. Um, I, I don't want to claim to be an expert on uh, how well that has worked in, certainly in, in Columbus. Um, uh, nationally, there's been uh, some research to suggest skepticism on how effective these, these programs have been. And uh, so I'll, I'll just, I'll leave it at that. We have time for one more question. Uh, Brian Williams, local nexus, uh, freelance writer and uh, consultant. Uh, I have, uh, th th we've had, kind of had this theme of, of, of getting back to, into reinvestment in uh, uh, existing communities. Uh, Mid Ohio Regional Planning Commission a couple years ago had a uh, speaker who talked about self gentrification and, uh, and, and, and what that gets to is how do, how do we rebuild neighborhoods in a way that the people living there now share in any new wealth that is created in those those neighborhoods uh you know that that's a way to kind of stave off the gentrification i'd like to get your thoughts on that thank you anyway so move to prosper would have been a godsend for my mom anna may i would have loved move to prosper i mean i love how you framed it about mothers um People wake up and most people are thinking about opportunity. How am I going to feed my family? Uh, people want access to education, access to job and safety. We want safety. And um, people aren't necessarily bound by these maps thinking about, oh, it has to happen in these four blocks, right? Um, and so I think it's so important to just think beyond just these buzz terms like gentrification and um, recreate how we finance things, how we, um, uh, we haven't innovated on housing finance in like a century. It's crazy. What is a 30 year mortgage? Is that where it stops? That was invented by somebody. We can invent something else. Low income tax credits was invented by somebody. We can invent something else. And there is a movement to 
innovate in finance right now. It's happening um, in, in decentralized finance. And so I would say, how do we ensure that everybody has ownership? The answer is to innovate and um, uh, unleash human creativity. And, and if there's a problem, the obstacle is the way. Let's create a new financial instrument, um, one that everybody can access and benefit from and participate in. That has to be the final word, unfortunately. We wish we had more time, but we'll turn it back over to CMC Presiding Officer Eddie Pauline for concluding remarks. Well, great, great conversation today. I, uh, I always like to leave uh, these luncheons with a little bit of homework, and I think we heard about the importance that local government plays in addressing uh, this, this, this issue. Uh, we have a election coming up on November 2nd. Uh, I would encourage all of you to take a hard look at those running for office and investigate their stance on diversifying housing stock, inclusive housing, zoning, and ensure that we're supporting people that are uh, open um, to changing some of these policies at the local level. Um, so piece of homework for you. Uh, please make plans now to join us next Wednesday as CMC welcomes Columbus Chief of Police Elaine Bryant to our stage for a special one-on-one -on -one interview. Thank you again to today's forum sponsors, AARP Ohio, Central Ohio Community Improvement Corporation, the Columbus Foundation, the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission, Move to Prosper, Nationwide Children's Hospital, The Ohio State University, United Way of Central Ohio. Thank you to the Emergency Response Fund of the Columbus Foundation for presenting our live stream in partnership with the Columbus Dispatch and PNC. And thank you to our online virtual seat patrons. And our special appreciation and thanks to our speakers, Richard Kallenberg, Lori Ann Feeble, Calvin Cooper, and our host, Kim Campbell. Thank you all for joining us. We could not do this without you. We look forward to seeing you next Wednesday as the Columbus Metropolitan Club presents another community conversation. Thank you.